Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the City of Lake Forest Park City Council regular meeting for Thursday, March 28th, 2024, to order. Uh, I will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Uh, and with that, do I hear a motion for adoption of the agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any nays? Aye. Thank you, Councilmember Bertani. Welcome. Oh, here. Uh, do I hear any nays? The ayes have it. Thank you very much, Council. It passes unanimously. And with that, we'll open public comment. Chief, thank you. Looking very studious there, Chief Boss. <laughs> All right. So we have um, public comments. Let's see here. Let me read my, my blurb here. Uh, this portion of the agenda is set aside for the public to address the Council on agenda items or any other topic the council might have purview or control over. If the comments are of a nature that the council does not have influence or control over, then the mayor may request the speaker suspend their comments. The council may direct staff to follow up on items brought up by the public. Comments are limited to a three minute time limit. And I will just say as a side note, we had a very unfortunate incident on Monday. Uh, and there is a question actually whether there was a violation of state statutes, which constitutes a felony in the comments that were made. So anyone who makes comments both online or in house, I would remind you to be civil and respectful. Okay, with that, first commenter, uh, Mr. Kiefer, please join us at the podium. Good evening. On March 7th, I addressed the Mayor and City Council requesting three minutes of public comment. The mayor denied my request, stating that the public comment period had passed. I explained that the meeting had begun at 6 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. as posted on the agenda. There had been no public notice of a time change. I asked that my written comments be admitted, which was approved by the mayor. The council was silent. Subsequently, I learned that no one from the public had spoken during the public comment period. Apparently, listening to the public is not a priority of the mayor, of this mayor and this council. On March 6th, 2024, I submitted a letter to the mayor and a council, subject being Lake Forest Park Climate Ideology Activist $500,000 boondoggle. As of this date, I have not received an acknowledgement or a reply. On October 18, 2023, I submitted a letter to the mayor and council alleging that the city had violated the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 4230 RCW, and Article 8, Section 7 of the state constitution, gift of public funds relative to the acquisition of the new waterfront park properties. Todd Charles Turner, the property owner and debtor before the U.S. Bankruptcy Court, received a gift of almost $2 million from the city after purchasing the property assessed at $3,099,000 for more than $5 million. On March 1, 2024, I again requested in writing acknowledgement and a reply to this letter. As of this date, the city remains silent. Your deceit, disrespect, and manipulation of the citizens of Lake Forest Park is duly noted. Moving on, uh, Mr. Sprugel, would you like to speak? Welcome, Doug. I actually came for a different purpose, but I noticed that the uh, connector across the road is on the on the agenda, and so I simply wanted to say that um, 
I hope the council is retaining the option of not doing it at all. I see you comparing different options, but I hope that you're retaining the option of not doing it at all. I live about half a mile from here. I come here a couple of times a week in the summer, either on foot or on my bike. And I've never had any trouble at all getting across Buffalo Way at the crosswalk. Um, so before, I guess what I'm gonna say is before you spend 15 to $30 million on this, I hope there'll be as much opportunity for public input as there has been for the waterfront park. I think it's been wonderful. It's been a great job, but this is three to six times as much. And I've not been aware of much public outreach at all on this. So I'm hoping that before serious money gets spent, that there will be. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Richard Olmstead. For later. Okay, you bet. You're you're presenting later. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. No, that's fine. Uh, and I believe we are. Is there anyone else in the chambers that would like to make public comment? I think we've covered everybody. Um, and do we have anyone else here online? Yeah. Uh, does not look like there's anyone else online. And thank you. And with that, we'll close public comment. Uh, moving on, we have two proclamations. My colleagues have graciously agreed to read. And the first one is going to be read by Councilmember Riddle. It's Sexual Assault, Assault Awareness Month, April 2024. Councilmember Riddle. Thank you. Proclamation. Whereas sexual assault is pervasive, every 68 seconds, someone is sexually assaulted in the United States. And whereas Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, people living in poverty, LGBTQ plus people, elders, people with disabilities, and others who have been historically oppressed are disproportionately affected by sexual violence in significant and complex ways. And whereas sexual assault is among the most underreported crimes for many reasons, but survivors who are already most marginalized face additional barriers to reporting, such as language, immigration status, or disability. And whereas ending sexual violence requires us to address racism, sexism, and all forms of oppression, they can contribute to the perpetuation of sexual assault. And whereas sexual violence exists on a continuum of behavior that includes racist, sexist, transphobic, homophobic, ableist, or other hate speech. This ranges from rape jokes to verbal harassment to physical assaults. And whereas by working together as a community, we can alleviate the trauma of sexual violence by ensuring supportive resources are available to all survivors while standing up and actively disrupting harmful attitudes and behaviors that contribute to sexual violence. Now, therefore, the mayor and the city council of Lake Forest Park do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month in the city of Lake Forest Park and join advocates and communities throughout King County in taking action to prevent sexual violence by standing with survivors. Together, we commit to a safer future for all children, young people, adults, and families in our community. Signed this 28th day of March. 2024. Thank you, council member. And then we're going to move on to Earth Day and Arbor Day 2024. Council member Goldman. Yep, thanks. Happy to. Whereas in 2024, Washington State celebrates Arbor Day on April 10th and Earth Day on April 22nd, and National Arbor Day is on April 26th. And whereas both days present a time to recognize the importance of preserving our natural resources. <laughs> And whereas the city of Lake Forest Park recognizes the benefits of its urban forests for improving air and water quality, combating climate change, and generally enhancing the quality of life. And whereas the city of Lake Forest Park is designated Tree City for the 21st year. And whereas the city of Lake Forest Park wants to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. And whereas we are all stewards of this earth and have a responsibility to preserve it for future generations. Now, therefore, the mayor and city council of the city of Lake Forest Park do hereby call upon all citizens of Lake Forest Park to join in celebrating Earth Day by preserving and enhancing our natural environment and by commemorating Earth Day and Arbor Day in Lake Forest Park, signed this 28th day of March 2024. Thank you very much, council member. All right, we are going to move on to presentations. Uh, we are going to start with the end of 2024 legislative session report, our legislative Lobbyist Shelley Helder has joined us. Thank you, Shelley, for making the journey. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. I am Shelley Helder, and I have the privilege of representing the city of Lake Forest Park in Olympia as your contract lobbyist. I'm here this evening to um, provide you with a report on the 2024 legislative session. 
Um, before I get started on the presentation, I just want to note that in your council packet is a comprehensive written report of um, much more than I'll be able to cover in th this evening's presentation. So um, please use that as a, a resource both now and into the future when you wonder, wait, what was that that the legislature did? Um, that, that document's helpful for those questions. Um, I think, is the slide deck getting to get pulled up? Okay, great, I'll get started. Um, so I plan to cover four topics um, in tonight's presentation. Uh, the first is an overview of the 2024 session. Uh, next, I'll talk about outcomes of the city's legislative priorities. Um, also cover some additional city-related um, outcomes. And then finally, we'll talk about next steps. So the 2024 session was the second year of the legislative biennium. The second year is always the short session. So it's 60 days and it's uh, rapid fire, 60 consecutive days of action. The primary objective in a short session is for the legislature to adopt supplemental uh, budgets. Um, those are minor adjustments to the existing state biennial budgets. And then um, in addition to adopting supplemental budgets, the legislature can of course change the law. There were over 1,500 pieces of legislation introduced in the short session, 376 were passed into law. Um, that is um, an, a number that continues to increase. Do I have control over it or do you? Okay, we're on slide three. Um, and as you'll see on the slide here momentarily, um, the number of bills introduced this year relative to two years ago, which is the most easiest way to compare since every other year is a short session. Um, obviously the number of bills introduced grew and the number of bills that passed the legislature grew. Um, this pattern is continuing every year and I would expect it um, to continue the same. Um, within the political context, Democrats still held strong majorities in both the House and the Senate. Um, so there was no change there from the first year to the second year of the biennium. Um, one of the new dynamics was that there were six initiatives that were presented to the legislature. Um, and initiatives are simply legislation that's sponsored by the people. And so these six initiatives, the legislature has the option, they have three options. They can adopt the initiative as presented, they can adopt an alternative and both the initiative and the alternative end up on the November ballot, or they can do nothing and then the, the initiative goes to the ballot. And so they chose to adopt three of the initiatives, the three that have no impact on state budgets and chose to do nothing for the other three. And so those three, which do have implications for the state's budgets will be on the November ballot. Next slide. So the state has three budgets, the operating, the capital, and the transportation. Um, the operating is the largest of the state's three budgets, and it, um, of course, funds all state agency operations, the largest of which is the K-12 through education system. Um, the February revenue forecast is uh, what was used to determine how much revenue was available for the supplemental budget. Um, and the revenue forecast predicted an increase of 1.2 billion over the previous forecast that was used to develop the biennial budget. So you may see those numbers differently depending on what forecast you're comparing them to, but essentially an additional 1.2 billion beyond what was available in uh, when the biennial budget was adopted. The supplemental budget um, spends an additional $2.1 billion, bringing the biennial budget to $71.9 billion. And I like to provide both those numbers just so you can see in context. The, the biennial budget was roughly $69 billion before the supplement was adopted. That's a much larger budget than the supplemental. So in the supplemental year, there are, again, very small changes that are being made. Um, one of the most significant changes when it comes to local governments is an elimination of the 25% cost share requirement when sending new recruits to the basic law enforcement academy. So if um, Lake Forest Park hires a new police officer and you need to send them to the academy for training, 
historically, um, the city would have to pay 25% of that. That 25% cost share is eliminated beginning July 1 of this year. The capital budget um, is the smallest of the three, and it funds um, nonprofit and public construction projects. Um, the supplemental budget is $1.3 billion, and that brings the total biennial budget to $10.3 billion. Um, the majority of the capacity for the supplemental budget came from Climate Commitment Act revenues, federal dollars, and the Model Toxics Control Account. Um, there was very limited bonding capacity for the supplemental budget. That's why the majority of the money came from those other sources. Um, because so much money in the capital budget came from the Climate Commitment Act, a lot of those um, investments are dependent on um, the initiative that would repeal the act failing. And so those projects are contingent on that failing. They're not a, that funding's not available until January of 2025 once we know the outcome of the um, of the initiative. Um, the significant investments to note within the capital budget are um, an additional, uh, what is the amount, $127 million for the Housing Trust Fund, which helps fund affordable housing projects around the state, um, as well as over $100 million for behavioral health facilities. The third, um, the third state budget is the transportation budget, and of course this funds our state's transportation system, which includes our highways, um, ferries, active transportation, transit system, and all transportation-related state agency operations. Um, this was by far the most constrained of the three budgets um, and the one that the budget writers had the greatest challenge coming to agreement on. Um, the supplemental budget allocates $1 billion of new spending, bringing the total amount to $14.6 billion for the biennium. And that, that new spending is primarily from federal dollars, again, Climate Commitment Act dollars, um, and some from um, advancing funds from the Move Ahead Washington package. Um, most of the spending is directed to a handful of areas, two mega projects, both the 520 bridge and 405, um, fish barrier removal, capital improvements to ferries, and highway preservation are some of the largest ticket items within that new spending. Um, and again, because so much of the new spending is from Climate Commitment Act revenues, it is contingent on the initiative failing. Um, traditional transportation revenues, which are the gas tax or license, permits, fees, that revenue source is down 8% this biennium or since the biennium began, which is $56 million. Next slide. Okay. So the city adopts a two-year legislative agenda. Um, to align with the state's two-year legislative cycle. And um, the city did make adjustments to this agenda following the 2023 session to reflect what was accomplished. Um, and then we, we adjusted accordingly, realizing that it was gonna be a supplemental year. So the four priorities that you see on the screen um, are the items that we went to Olympia, um, hoping to make progress on in this second year of the biennium. The first is, of course, continuing to um, address fish barriers on Lion Creek. In the 2023 session, the city received a $1.8 million award for the Lion Creek barrier at State Route 104. Um, and that was a significant achievement, not only because that is a very large dollar amount to receive in um, a state award, but also because of the, the method in which it was allocated. It wasn't through the traditional grant program. Um, we kind of skipped the line and, and we're very lucky in doing so. Um, in addition to that amount, which is retained in, in the supplemental budget, um, the state allocated a little over $20 million to the Fish Barrier Removal Board, which is the more traditional route for local governments to receive funding for fish barriers. And that $20 million is um, a, the biennial budget has 40 million roughly for the fish barrier removal board. So an additional 20 million in a supplemental year is a significant sum. And I think is a reflection of the legislature's understanding that in order to address fish barriers holistically, there has to be more resources put towards locals. And so I would expect um, and hope to see that moving forward. I will again note that a lot of that funding is Climate Commitment Act connected. 
Uh, the second priority is investments on State Route 104, and this kind of falls into three categories or three subcategories. Um, the first is for maintenance and preservation. Um, WashDOT has indicated that they are scheduled to do an overlay on 104 in 2027. Um, city staff is um, asking that that be advanced. Obviously, 2027 is a long time away. Um, and so it should help our efforts that the supplemental budget um, increases funding for maintenance and preservation, bringing the total amount to $1 billion for the biennium. That's the largest amount in maintenance and preservation that the state has ever allocated. Um, and then over the next two biennia, there's 80 million per biennia for, for maintenance. So there's a significant amount of maintenance and preservation dollars flowing. The second subcategory for um, SR 104 is complete streets. And this is kind of a, a principle that we want WashDOT to incorporate into any improvements that are made through the corridor. Um, a couple of years ago, the legislature passed a law saying that WashDOT had to incorporate complete streets principles into any state project above $500,000. And so at this point, it's a matter of implementation. Um, I think there's conversations happening between city staff and the and WashDOT's regional office about what, what project meets that threshold and then where are the resources to be able to do those improvements because WashDOT's been given this directive, but that doesn't necessarily mean there are um, financial resources for them to implement. So it's definitely something that we will um, need to stay on top of. And then the third um, component on State Route 104 is the request for um, assistance with the funding gap of $2 million for the roundabout at 40th Place Northeast. In 2019, the city was awarded $650,000 um, to help with this project. And at the time, we had thought that that would be the final amount needed, assuming that a competitive grant award would be coming through. That grant ultimately didn't end up coming through at the timing that we expected, and then COVID hit, and project costs have risen, and so now we're at the point where the gap is greater than we um, previously expected it to be. Um, we did advance this request of a two million dollars uh, of two million dollars in the supplemental year, knowing knowing full well that that amount. Um, combined with the fact that the transportation budget didn't have resources for any new projects um, was going to be really challenging. And of course, there, there was no funding available for our local projects. Um, so there's definitely more, more work to be done on that. The third item on the city's legislative agenda, city financial challenges. Um, this is something that we continue to focus on, both because of the city's or because of the state imposed cap on local property tax growth, as well as the continued growth in um, local costs that are outside the city's control, things like liability insurance premiums um, continue to grow beyond what, um, beyond 1%. <laughs> um, there was um, a really broad coalition that um, tried to push lifting that cap from 1% to 3% and tying it to inflation. Um, initially, we thought that there was going to be really good um, momentum on this, and it came to a screeching halt under political pressure. Um, and in an election year, it was, it was not viable. So I do expect this to continue as well. The final area for focus was behavioral health care system needs. Um, as you all know, the city is a member of the regional radar program, and that's really becoming um, a model around the state for other communities. Um, so we supported the state investing in sustainable funding for co-responder services, um, as well as additional crisis stabilization centers around the state. Um, the legislature did pass Senate bill, there's a typo up there, it should be Senate bill 5853, um, which allows 23-hour crisis relief um, facilities to serve minors so long as there is separation between the adults and the, the children's facility, um, as well as an additional million to expand the crisis relief center model. Next slide. In addition to the city's top priorities, we also had a number of other issues that we um, engaged in. So um, the first was the city's tools and resources, and, and 
specific, specifically, we were wanting more tools and resources to prompt affordable, um, affordable housing at the lower AMI levels. Um, there were no new tools passed for cities when it comes to affordable housing, but there, there was an additional 127 million allocated to the housing trust fund um, and 232 million for um, housing and homelessness services. Of that 232 million, 34 million is directed to local governments. So there, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, they're just, you have to go out and get them. Um, in the category of recycle materials and solid waste, there was another effort at pushing um, the Rewrap Act, which is a producer responsibility program for um, paper and certain uh, packaging manufacturers. Um, this was, I think, the third year that this concept has come forward. It is um, a, a relatively heavy lift for the legislature, and these types of policies often take many years. Um, this year, it did advance further than it has in the past, and so I, I expect, again, this is another one that will be back next year, um, and we'll continue to make more progress on. The city supported changing um, state law to allow cities to use traffic safety cameras to enforce bus-only lane violations. Um, and so House Bill 2384 is the bill that would have, or that, that does allow that authority. As it was originally introduced, we supported it because it included that authority and that's something that we wanted to see. As the bill advanced through the process, it was, um, changed several times. Um, at um, many stages in the process, it would have um, reduced and very, very limited the city's ability to decide how revenue from traffic safety cameras is used and would have essentially immediately created a deficit in current city budget because current uses would not have been allowed. So we worked, um, we worked very hard to make sure that current uses are grandfathered in. Where the final bill ended up is cities that have existing traffic safety camera programs can use that revenue from existing cameras for the purposes that you have already indicated. If there is growth in the traffic safety camera program in terms of number of cameras beyond 10%, anywhere beyond 10%, that revenue has to be used for traffic safety activities. It is not a defined term, and so um, there are ex examples within the legislation of what they mean by traffic safety activities, but really the legislature's intent in expanding traffic safety camera authority is for that revenue to be dedicated to traffic safety. Um, finally, on um, the topic of public safety, the legislature did adopt initiative 2113, which is referred to as the, the pursuits initiative. And this allows police officers to engage in the vehicular pursuit if they have reasonable suspicion to believe that a person has violated the law. Finally, House Bill 2088 extends liability protections for co-responders. So that's something that's um, important for co-responder programs like, like RADAR. So um, there's a lot of information. With all of that information, what comes next? Um, you can go to the next slide. So my advice um, is always to begin with gratitude. Um, legislators put their lives on hold um, in the short session for 60 days and a long session for 105 days. Um, and they, they are just fully, there's no way to do that job during the legislative session except to be fully committed to that work. Um, and so I just, I, whether you see, you know, first district legislators around town or at meetings, wherever you see them, I would just encourage you to go out of your way to, to, to say thank you to them for their service to the district um, and to the state. There um, are several new policies that will require implementation from city staff. And I mentioned it, but there are lots of grant programs that are available, um, both new money that's been available through the supplemental budget, also money that was in the biennial budget that's still getting pushed out through different state agencies. And so my encouragement to the city is to take advantage of any and all grant op opportunities. 
um, which is a, a segue into the next item in terms of preparing for the 2025 session. Um, typically, uh, the legislative priority or legislative steering committee um, develops recommendations for the council to consider in the fall of what the priorities should be for the new biennium. Um, and so I would just put a bug in each of your ear to start thinking about what, what the city's priorities should be for this um, next, next year. Um, and to consider then how that may align with different um, grant programs that the city that the state has already established. There's recreation and salmon habitat and freight mobility. And I mean, like the state is definitely moving in the direction of creating grant programs rather than just doing strict earmarks. And if you if we still go after earmarks, um, it you are more competitive and more likely to succeed if you have already applied for a grant. Whether or not you're successful in receiving that grant, um, budget writers like to see that you've taken advantage of the opportunities that they've provided. Um, between now and the next legislative session, there will be, of course, the November election. The entire House and half of the Senate is up for election, which includes all three members of the city's legislative delegation. We um, also have a governor's race and several statewide elected offices. Um, and then, of course, three initiatives that, um, as I mentioned, have impacts on the state's budgets. Um, the Association of Washington Cities um, completes their legislative setting priority process as well. It begins in the spring for them and um, carries out through the summer and fall. And so if the city kind of has an idea of things that you may want to be considering, it's always helpful to um, share that with the association and see if they would consider incorporating that into their priorities as well. The uh, 2025 session starts uh, second Monday in January, January 13th. And there are, there are a lot of unknowns, as I just mentioned, we'll have many new members of the legislature, a new governor, potentially some budget challenges. Um, but the one thing we do know for certain is that the legislature will need to adopt new budgets. And we we'll wanna be ready to take advantage of any opportunities that are available with that budget development. So with that, I will end and see if there are any questions. Thanks, Shelley. I know there were a lot of sleepless nights for some of us, particularly for you. I think there was 10 days that uh, Administrator Hill and I didn't sleep a whole lot because of some challenges down there, but thank you for all you've done for us. Colleagues, questions for Ms. Helder? Just again, to appreciate uh, or, uh, our appreciation for the efforts that you are providing down there. I think it's it's been incredible to have a voice that's known and knowledgeable down uh, at the Capitol. So uh, we can at least get some of these things moved through and uh, appreciate the work you've done for us in the past and looking forward to the new budget, new opportunities. We'll see what we can do next time around. Yeah, thank you. Any other thank questions you. for Ms. Heller? Councilmember Goldman. Yes, uh, thanks for the report. Um, one of the bills that did not pass this year was a uh, transit-oriented development. Uh, do you foresee that coming back to the legislature next year, or is that sort of kind of contingent on how how the election goes? That's a great question. You're right. I, um, for the sake of brevity, I didn't focus on very many bills that didn't pass, but there are a substantial number of bills that didn't pass that I do think will be back in 2025. Transit-oriented development, while I do think that there is still a lot of interest in passing some type of statewide policy about how cities should be zoning around transit um, transit stops, there is within the supplemental uh, budget direction for, I forget what agency, I think it's Department of Commerce, to essentially conduct a transit-oriented development um, study and report on like best practices. Um, and that's supposed to be done in alignment with the final comp plan, which majority of the parts of the state that have transit service levels that we're talking about are going through the comp plan process right now. And so, um, the idea, I think, for this report is that um, some of the best practices will be reflected in cities and counties comp plans, and um, that we'll be able to demonstrate that this work is already being done. Um, so I guess that's a really long way of saying, yes, I do expect the legislation to return. I don't know yet how much traction it will get. I think a lot of that will be dependent on comp, comp plan rollouts. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. 
colleagues, any additional? Councilmember Fertani, who is overseas. What time is it there? It is, uh, let's see, now it's at uh, 11.35 in the morning. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, well, hello, everyone, and uh, thanks, Ms. Helder, for the uh, great report, as always. And um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, regarding the recyclable materials and solid waste, I understood that the rewrap bill that was two sessions ago got repackaged into two different bills, which was one was extended producer responsibility, and the other one was a bottle bill, essentially modeled after organs. I'm wondering, um, is this strategy going to continue, and what do you think the likelihood of success there is going to be next session? Yeah, good question. You're right. It definitely was broken into two bills, and I do think that that was a strategy that um, – that I do think that's a strategy that will continue because I think that that's important for um, neither policy to get um, bogged down by the other. So there are really two separate ideas that are trying that were originally trying to advance jointly while they have similar goals, um, very different policy and practical implications. So um, I do think that the that both concepts will continue. I think we'll see them both reintroduced next year, um, and I I think keeping them separate is the best best opportunity for success. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, any other questions for Shelley tonight? Seeing none, thank you so much for, you're very incredibly responsive to this community and we do really appreciate it. And um, the budgetary considerations that we were concerned about, I know you helped us navigate through that very um, deftly and we really appreciate that. So, My pleasure. Many thanks. Thank you. Have a great rest of your evening. Okay, we are moving on here. Let's see. We are uh, Richard Olmstead. We're going to move on to the Tree Board Annual Report and Work Plan. Welcome, Richard. Hello. Thank you for uh, having me and giving the opportunity to talk about what the Tree Board has been up to and is intending to be up to. Um, you should have received uh, copies of the last year's annual report and this, this year's work plan. So what I would like to do is just hit some of the highlights about what we've, our activities have been in the last year and then move directly into what our uh, priorities are for this coming year and then take questions at the end if you have any. I'd like to start by saying uh, thanks to all of the pre-board members who have been involved and we've had significant turnover this year four board members terms either uh, ended in the last year or have left the board, uh, including Julia Bent, who is our longest serving board member, um, Marty Byrne and Sandra LeVar, and sadly, um, Mandy Parker, who died uh, in the past year uh, very um, uh, prematurely, I would say. But we have three new board members. One is familiar to all of you, Mark Phillips, I'm sure, and then Stacy Spain and Victoria Kutaz. So at the present, we have five members and are still two board members down. Uh, there's been turnover, as you know, in our ties to the government, through the city, through the staffing, uh, but we're really pleased that everybody is, we're fully staffed now and have a new, uh, not arborist, but, um, I've forgotten the title for the urban forest planner. So <laughs> urban forest planner. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, and of course, Larry Goldman, our uh, city council liaison has been a steady uh, hand and uh, keeping us informed in uh, city issues. Um, in the past year, uh, one of the things that has been important for the city and for you all, as well as uh, our interests was the, um, the tree inventory, which was completed, and uh, we had an early opportunity to provide feedback to um, the CDG watershed uh, early draft, and we think that uh, they did a good job of responding to our concerns. I would highlight Doug Sprugel, who is here tonight, uh, who is a retired UW Forest ecologist and really understood the, the nitty gritty of the data and the methods that went into that. It was very helpful. And we anticipate that the data will be helpful for us to bring a recommendation to the council in the coming year for uh, uh, perhaps changes to the exceptional tree uh, portion of the tree code. Uh, we had a couple of outreach activities last year, the Arbor Day planting up at Horizon View Park, a beautiful Japanese snowbell. 
tree that did flower last June. I, we had volunteers who kept it watered over the summer, and I think it will probably establish well and be beautiful for many years to come. The sort of at the north uh, west corner of the park. We had a table at the LFP Green Fair last year and will be present again this year, this Saturday. So if any of you are out and about, stop at the Green Fair uh, and look for our booth. We had a uh, good start at getting some um, outreach um, activities surrounding uh, scheduling, calendars, uh, social media and print um, uh, applications by uh, board members, Marty Byrne and Sandy LeVar, but uh, both of whom have left the board, but two of the new board members, Stacey Spain and Victoria Kutaz, are very interested in outreach activities. So we see a smooth transition and we already have some uh, activities going on uh, that we hope to be able to roll out soon. In fact, at the Green Fair, I think we'll have some of our early um, print brochures available. Um, Julia Bent uh, wrapped up the big McAleer Creek uh, invasive species removal and restoration project uh, with money from uh, the King County Water Works uh, that uh, supplied most of the money and we were able to hire people to do that work. Um, there will probably be a little bit of follow-up work, maybe some replanting needed in places where uh, there's been some mortality of plants that went in, but uh, we're really pretty happy with the outcome of that. Um, so that's about it, I would say, for the, the annual report. I'll move along to the work plan for this coming year. We uh, will continue to do outreach uh, around events and uh, outreach to residents. Um, this year, we have an Arbor Day uh, event plan that will be around ivy removal. Ivy is a, a significant threat to our urban forests, and we've already done some activity around ivy and other invasive species in the past, but we want to be uh, continuing to keep that in the forefront of uh, our activities and uh, residents' minds, and we plan some outreach as well as uh, producing a a demo on ivy removal that uh, video demo that we can uh, host that the city can host on the website that will help encourage residents to believe that they can make a contribution towards uh, ivy removal on their own. We look forward to enhancing and and uh, doing more uh, collaboration with other groups in the city, including the Stewardship Foundation, the Parks Board, Climate Action Committee, and so on. I think there's a uh, opportunity for a lot of uh, synergy if the tree board and those groups can interact more. They have not done so much in the past, although we have had good close relations, especially with the Stewardship Foundation. Um, we've also been very active in the last year with uh, the um, Transit plans, uh, we look forward to seeing uh, resources come into Lake Forest Park to help with uh, mitigation of tree loss and uh, expanding tree plantings in the city. I think we're sort of at the mercy of the scheduling of that and then probably that will push beyond 2024, but we're keeping that in front of mind. Um, one outcome of the the tree inventory, as I mentioned earlier, is that we anticipate being able to look at data about uh, tree size distributions in the city to help uh, refine our exceptional tree ordinance. Um, and then we hope also to revisit the uh, recommended tree uh, list for replacement when tree removal permits are granted uh, to try to refine that to better serve the residents of the community who are relying on that for their uh, planning around replacement trees. And then we also look forward to uh, collaborating with or uh, uh, advising perhaps the council on uh, the, the um, comprehensive plan that's ongoing, especially with respect to any 
aspect of the comprehensive plan that impinges on our urban forests and trees in uh, the city. So that's about it for the plan for going forward. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Richard. Colleagues, questions, Mr. Oldstein. Mr. Furtani, I'll give you the floor first, if you like. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you, Mr. Olmsted. And the work of the tree board is so important. And I want you to thank them as well. I know you've gone through a lot of turnover and uh, Councilmember Goldman has kept us surprised of all the changes. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that everything is going apace. Um, I que my question to you is, and I've been a little bit concerned about this, is that, um, you know, is the tree board starting to look at how climate change is affecting uh, the moisture content of our trees, specifically um, with regard to the wildfire threat? Uh, urban wildfires, I didn't used to think be a thing, but but actually, as it turns out, you know, we've seen in California, especially in the Santa Rosa fire, how that can be a very significant factor in natural hazards. I'm wondering if uh, the tree board's given any thought to how to assess these kinds of threats. Well, we haven't really directly, but I could see that as a area of uh, cooperation with the Climate Action Committee, for example, um, obtaining data on things like uh, soil moisture, moisture content and tree canopy and so on is pretty technical. It's not the sort of thing that we as volunteer board members would necessarily be able to undertake on our own, but it's the sort of thing that I think with uh, coordination of efforts and some uh, uh, planning might be a, the sort of uh, pro proposal that could be brought forward to uh, for future uh, analysis. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And on point, uh, just for edification of our new council members, there was a member of the community that wrote us a very compelling letter about this very, very topic and exploring whether we were prepared in case of um, urban wildfire kind of situation. So happy to forward that on to you as well. It's an important topic. Uh, that would be nice, I think, if you could forward that to the tree board. I you think bet. We'd be, we'd be happy to see it. Yeah, we'll make a note of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was last November, I'm trying, to, trying to remember here. <laughs> but we'll make a note of the colleagues. Other questions? Mr. Olmstead. Thank you. Well, I'd love to express my thanks and my thanks of all my colleagues here for your hard work. You guys are doing really important work in this community. We're really excited that we have a new staff member on board too. Mm -hmm. New title will take us a little time to get used to, but we'll get there, I think. <laughs> so I, I should note that I'm stepping down as chair. I've been chair of the tree board for the last two years. And Doug Sprugel, who has been vice chair of this last year, will be taking over as chair uh, this year. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much you. to all of you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and now, let's see, where are we? We are on the town center to Burke Gilman Trail Connection. Uh, our project manager, Katie, has a some information to share with us. Welcome, Katie Phillips. This is, it, I believe, is, is this your first time speaking? So please introduce yourself. We have some new colleagues here and and uh, some familiar faces as well. Uh, yeah, Th thank you, Mayor. This is my first time speaking here. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Hello, everyone. I'm Katie Phillips, Project Manager in the Public Works Department. Um, I do have a slide deck. Is that? Yes, it's coming. Very good. Wonderful. <laughs> so the, the reason that I'm here tonight to talk to you about this project is um, to seek feedback for the scope of work for the 30% design contract for the town center to Burt Gilman Trail Connector. And the reason that I'm asking for that now um, is, is because we've had some newly elected officials uh, welcome everyone. And the way the scope was written was, it was, it was to accommodate the recommendations of members that are, that are no longer a part of your group. So we just wanna review everything and make sure that you either still wanna do exactly what you did before or, or maybe something else. So what I'm gonna do in my presentation is review the history of the project and review the scope of work and talk about how it got to be that way. Um, so next slide, please. So in 2020, we did a feasibility study and that looked at three options for a grade separated crossing connecting town center to the Burt Gilman Trail. There's two options shown here because they were the two that got pushed forward. And um, 
the first one there is a it's a tunnel. It starts at the city hall side and it moves diagonally under 522. Um, there's stairs and ramps at the city hall side and there's um, depressed ramps on the Burt Gilman side leading down to it on either side. And the reason that it's positioned diagonally is to avoid Lion Creek. Um, the creek comes right to the edge of that one Southern Burt Gilman uh, ramp there on the Burt Gilman side. And so there, there are some considerations, drawbacks for this design. One is safety and sight lines. Um, it's inherent with tunnels, but even more so with a tunnel that's skewed to this degree that there's blind spots, places potentially to hide or for someone to be hidden. And um, the, the, the feeling of unsafety, but also the, the reality of it not being safe was a concern early on. And um, the next big concern with this design is tree removal. Our feasibility study did say that all of the trees between Ballinger Way and the creek would have to be removed in order to build this. Um, and then the, the last concern, um, which is also a big one, is the water table. This tunnel would be completely below the water table in order to build it. The, the whole area would have to be dewatered, um, which is very expensive and challenging, and it would require lengthy close, closings of 522 once it was built, um, the structure would have to continue to be waterproof long term, um, which which is more maintenance. And all of the water that came in from rain would have to be pumped out. And because the power usually goes out when there's big storm events, we'd also have to have backup generators. So there's there's a big price tag on this design, like from the get go. But then there's also extra costs long term and and our public works department would, it would be more work and more money. Uh, the benefits though of this, of this design is that there's no bridge visual, um, which, which is appealing to some. And there's also not really any property impacts, um, which, would, which, would make, which would make that part of it easier. The other design shown on this slide is the primary uh, bridge option that got pushed forward and it has, a serpentine ramp that starts at City Hall and makes its way up over the property that's currently uh, the bank property. And then it connects to an overpass, which connects to the Burt Gilman lifted up and, and the Burt Gilman would go down on either side coming back to, to street level. Um, the biggest concern with this design is property impacts. It, it would require a full acquisition of, of that, that bank property right next to us. Um, it, it does also mean that a, a bridge would be seen. So it, there's a visual impact there. The, on the plus side, it doesn't, this design doesn't really have any effects to the trees. And it, 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 it would be, a, I think the feasibility study said a, a, a walk through the canopy. Um, so just a little bit of tree trimming would be required on the Burt Gilman side uh, to accommodate um, those ramps that go down on either side. So it, it would be a good user experience, um, but property acquisition is, is the downside there. So we did this feasibility study. We came to these two primary ideas. And then what happened was King County Parks came to us and said that they didn't want us to change the grade of the Burt Gilman trail at all, um, essentially, making these two designs a no-go. So we took that information. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide, please. We uh, updated the bridge concept. So serpentine ramps the same. The overpass is the same. What's different is on the Burt Gilman side. Instead of raising the Burt Gilman up to meet the overpass, um, it has one ramp that just comes down to the Burt Gilman. And there's two different options shown there. Um, these are just concepts. Uh, like I said, this happened after the feasibility study. So they're, they're not designs, so to speak. They're just the ideas that we went with after we got that news from King County. And um, so the drawbacks of this change 
are that it would require more property acquisition um, than the original bridge. It would also require getting the farmer's insurance building across the street. Um, so it's a drawback, but it, you, you could also look at it maybe if you wanted to as a positive because it's a large paved area that we would be you know, giving back to nature. We would plant there, put trees there. It would, it would become more park-like under, under that part of the bridge. And um, there is some tree removal associated with this design because there are trees adjacent to the Burt Gilman in that area where you can see the green ramp coming down. Um, however, it's not as much tree removal as, as the other option. Um, this is the only design that does satisfy King County Park's uh, request that we not change the Burt Gilman to date. Um, and you can, if you're looking at the cost estimates, I haven't mentioned them yet because they're big numbers, they're there. I'm sure you've seen them, <laughs> they're big numbers, but um, this, this one is considered to be a little bit cheaper than the other bridge concept, uh, just because it doesn't have ramps on both sides. That's somewhat of a savings. Um, next slide, please, Matt. So while we were going through the exercise of updating that bridge concept, we did also try to work with an updated tunnel idea. And um, what this one is, is instead of having the tunnel skew under 522, it comes straight across perpendicular and it, it eliminates some of the sightline concerns. It makes the tunnel a little bit shorter, it makes it feel safer. It makes it actually a little bit safer. Um, so it's in that way, it's a better user experience. However, in order to accommodate making the tunnel run perpendicular to 522, um, the, the depressed Burt Gilman on either side of it scoots over, um, making it so that we have to also move the creek over. And um, we haven't looked into the environmental impacts of rerouting Lion Creek or the expense of that, or if it's permittable, any of that, but it it is an idea. And um, in that picture there, you can see the dark blue line is where the creek currently is. And the lighter blue line is where we would move the creek to if we uh, decided to go forward with this concept. So um, yeah, you can stay on this slide, that's fine. So where where we are is that um, we we sought funding to move to a 30% design for this project. And um, leadership at that time wanted us to look at both bridge and tunnel for that contract. So we wrote the scope of work so that we would do a 10% a advancing of this tunnel concept here. And um, once that was complete, we would come to you and say, do you want us to go to 30% with this tunnel concept or do you want us to switch gears and go back to the bridge? Um, like I said, we just wanna check in now before we get to 10% with this with this tunnel concept because of the considerations um, that, I, that I went over. And um, uh, you can go to the next slide if you want, Matt. So it leaves us with our options. Um, not change our scope of work at all and do what we planned on doing, develop a 10% of that um, tunnel concept or modify our scope of work and reallocate those funds, which is about $30,000 into a more robust uh, bridge design, 30% still. So the, that's where we're at. Thank Any questions? Very... That was a lot of information to cover. <laughs> I hope I didn't go too quickly. Councilor Riddle. Um, a question about the uh, perpendicular underpass with the depression of the Burt Gilman. Do we feel that there is a path to advancing that with King County Parks since they are not interested in changing the grade of the Burt Gilman? Um, I, I don't I don't think I can answer whether or not King County would go along with it it to, to me it doesn't seem like there is a path forward but i i i haven't been in any of the meetings that with king county i started um in december so i i haven't had any contact with king county and i really don't want to speak for what they might say in the future thank you Bill? is there 
Oh, Phil. Mr. Hill. And I've been here since the beginning, so I'll hop in and help <laughs> Katie out here. Um, our meeting, it was pretty, King County was pretty adamant about not changing the grade of the trail. The other thing too, is there, there are huge impacts, like Katie mentioned, to the tree canopy in that area, as well as, you know, how do you keep this dewatered long-term? You're talking pumps and things. And so I <laughs> encouraged she and Andy to bring this forward to you because I, it's time for a check-in. You know, this started, we got the contract signed and COVID hit. And so we did, you know, the first two years, we hadn't even met the consultants in person. It was all online. And we've been through this process as soon as everybody was comfortable. So when we had that first meeting with King County, they, they had been on notice, but not, I think, paying attention during COVID. And we got that feedback. And so I think if the city council is desirous of moving forward, you know, at least my recommendation is that we, I think the tunnel option is dead. I, I know there was a lot of concerns early on about it and safety. I think it has a lot of negative impacts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, th I think the prudent step would be to do the study complete to 30% design on the overpass. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be the long discussion about, you know, going out, out after, you know, if the council continues to move this forward, we need to have some more community involvement consideration of you know going after a raise grant or something there it's a large project there will be large matches so it's going to be a long discussion this isn't something that's going to occur in the foreseeable future thank you city administrator um i think that's exactly what what i was thinking as well um that, that it's it's likely the tunnel is is a non-starter uh, from here on out um and that the bridge would be the way to continue to pursue um, so that would be my thoughts Mm -hmm. Mr. Goldman, you look like you're thinking of raising your hand. I was anticipating. Yeah, um, I concur. I mean, uh, just from a cost perspective, also, I don't think we can justify thirty plus million dollars on the project. Mm -hmm. So I just don't see the tunnel as viable. Even the bridge, uh, I think that the cheaper bridge option was still sixteen million, and that's a, also a huge amount of money. So, I'll to be totally honest, I'm I am skeptical about the project considering the costs that are involved. Um. If we can get federal funding, then there might be a path through. But I do think the council is going to have to have a car, a, a hard conversation about whether the project is worth this cost. Um, and something that I, I brought up at the Monday Cow, but because um, relevant to the Lakefront Park, but also to this, I really do want us to look into ways to make that intersection safer for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, just, you know, it's going to be 2027 before WashDOT is doing their work on 104, 28 until Sound Transit comes through. What can we do in the interim to make this intersection safer, regardless of whether the bridge eventually gets built? So that, that that's where I'm at. Thank you, Council Member. Thanks. Council Member Furtani, I was, maybe you could put, put your perspective of our trip to D.C. into the mix too, Mr. Furtani. Sure, absolutely. Um, and for, first, uh, thank, thank you, Ms. Phils, for your uh, report. Um, and I agree with uh, Councilmember Goldman that this, for me, is not a starter at all. Um, besides the tree canopy, messing with the creek is going to be a really big lot lift. And we've already spent a fair amount of funds on basically fixing that creek. So let's stop fixing it. I apologize for any noise you may hear. I'm in a lobby. Um, so the uh, uh, the trip to D.C. that uh, um, the mayor and uh, council member, uh, Deputy Mayor Bodie and I took the other uh, week, um, the lobbying for federal funds, uh, to especially an earmark like this, is a difficult process. And one of the real um, things that, uh, um, well, the uh, program under which we applied for our particular earmark for the uh, um, community center was under the what's called the community development block grant. And the fact is that that really is funding projects that directly benefit the community. The connectivity that this would give us to uh, between the Burke Gilman and the urban would be awesome and, and town center would be awesome. However, I think they're, they'd be looking for other alternatives to fund that don't really require quite so much, uh, well, frankly, funding and, and of course all this um, disruption that would occur. So the, I'm in favor of looking at the bridge option. And as Councilmember Goldman said, looking at some other interim solutions in the meantime until we can secure such funding, you know, I, I'm looking at more and more something like a mid block between 170th and Ballinger 
uh, grade crossing, and it would be kind of protected by the two lights on either end. But nevertheless, it was, that seems to be a little bit cheaper of an option than any of these proposals that I've seen so far. So I thank you for your work, but uh, yeah, I, I think we should pull back on this one. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Lebo. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Uh, Phillips, for the presentation today. I think you did an excellent job of describing it. As my other council members have expressed, I'm not supportive of a tunnel option for all the reasons that have been mentioned, environmental cost and safety. I um, have a couple questions and then a comment. I want to check on the distance that's proposed for the uh, ramp there in both options. One was about 281 feet, which at a 1 to 20 would represent only about a 14 foot height, which there is a uh, on a state route, a minimum height clearance for a bridge across a uh, state highway. And I'm not sure that we would meet it in the shorter version when you take into the uh, structure height. Um, in general, though, I am not supportive of moving forward with this project. I appreciate that we have gotten the grant funding for it, but as we've seen, grants come with restrictions and limitations that once you accept the grant, you need to proceed with it. And the cost of, of any of these options far exceed what we as a city could accommodate if there is an overrun on the project. Most grant agencies will expect the city uh, who receives a grant to complete the project, even if the grant funding doesn't cover all of the cost. I do see and agree with uh, my other colleagues with regard to, as Council Member Goldman stated, to look at options to make the crossing across um, SR 522 safer. There are some things that we could do both at the turn from SR 104, 104 on to Bothell Way there, as well as just crossing Bothell Way. Even moving the stop bar back from the crosswalk and making the crosswalk wider would give a sense of of comfort. It's always disconcerting when cars are on both sides or people inch too close to the crosswalk. I really do find that uh, as much as I enjoy capital projects, and we can talk long about capital projects, um, bridges can be really quite wonderful as a signature for inviting people as they enter a city. I do think, though, that bridges are really for places where you otherwise can't get across, such as a river or a freeway. But where we have options to cross, such as a crosswalk, I do think that this is a solution looking for a problem. And that uh, as a city, we should put our resources and requests for whether it's federal or state grants and things that are more achievable for us that represent good expenditure of all of our public money. Federal money is not free. I filed my taxes last week and it was at a quantity that could fund many things. So I think even if we think of grant money as free, it is not. And we should all be respectful of how we spend the public's money because it's ours. Thank you for the presentation. You've been introduced to the council. <laughs> Thanks. Council member Good. I also appreciate your presentation. It's very well done. I I don't know why they the original idea for a crosswalk or a tunnel was was asked for. I wasn't here, but I have been in neighborhoods where they have put uh, tunnels and or bridges, and really people don't use them. You know that there's a if there's a crosswalk there. Sometimes people don't want to climb up. Or sometimes people don't want to go underneath. But I think that the cost for this is really high. And I think that there's a lot more that can be done with the widening the the crosswalks, paint, you know, whatever we can do that's that's more affordable. But I do appreciate your work. Thank you. Um, I think for a little bit of context and, and history, I think the original idea of this uh, connector came up when we were anticipating getting the sound transit parking garage right there and that mm -hmm. added pedestrian traffic was going to cause was a cause of concern for the council at the time once we add that traffic to these uh, surface uh, crossings we were a little concerned about an opportunity for uh, a fatality or, or other you know just because the volume of people will go up um, so that's just a history kind of where we came up with this now of course that 
parking garage is put out till our great grandchildren's days when we're flying cars anyways <laughs> but um the but idea of this this connector has sort of lived on as as a as a safety item um as a bit of a landmark if it turns out to be beautiful um <laughs> and so it's just a history of where we kind of I appreciate that cuz that makes more sense to go across if there's a a big parking garage then you can extend yeah. off of that That's yeah it would have been like right across that makes the, the stalls from from the parking garage. So. I was remiss and didn't check with council member um, Saunders. Ellen, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I was so embarrassed that I didn't ask you before, and I and then I'm flummoxed here. It's so okay. please, did you have a okay. comment? I did. I wanted to before we went around the horn again. I do have a comment. I also appreciate all the work you have done on this. Um, I. It's a lot of money. Um, I support um, what all my um, colleagues have said here. I do feel like eventually there needs to be some kind of a safer way of crossing um, 522 to connect the um, the side, the town center and whatnot to the Burt Gilman Trail. I feel like that um, definitely a tunnel is out of the question in, in my opinion but perhaps some kind of a bridge, maybe a smaller, I don't know if there's some way we can scale it down, um, if it would be cheaper that way. But I feel like someday maybe we might come back to this. I don't know, that's just my opinion. I just feel like I could see um, some kind of a bridge apparatus going up over, over 522. I know that there are um, residents I've heard from who live on that side and their children need to come over to this side for various reasons. And there's been some near misses um, at crossing at the crosswalks. So um, I hear them and I, I respect what they're saying and their concerns and their safety is definitely a priority. So um, I'm hoping that maybe someday we can revisit this, but thank you. Thank you very much for all your work you've done on this. Appreciate that. Thank you, Ellen. Mm -hmm. um, Alex, oh, other Mr. Lee is the next. Um, thank you. My recollection is that Kenmore did a similar study about crossing um, SR 522. Do we recall if they did? My recollection was that they didn't find it financially viable for their situation. So I reached out to their city manager about a week or so ago, and they never... It, it was a council desire for a while. They never actually commissioned a study on that. It kind of lost traction and they, they've they just let it go. They will not be pursuing any type okay. of crossing. Okay. Thank you. Councilman so, Riddle. Um, I think the other thing that I appreciate about the bridge concept, and, and Matt, if you can go back to the black and white original version um, there on the right side, is a little hard to see at this scale, but the serpentine on the uh, town center side really creates an opportunity for a little park in mm -hmm. a way we, that can be planted, that can become, it's mm -hmm. less urban on that side. So I, I kind of see an interesting opportunity for us to create a, a new green space, a uh, public green space here in the town center that we don't know, we don't naturally have an availability to do right now. So that's another piece to the, the current bridge design. If we can hold on to something like that, I would that would be really amazing for this community to have that green space right there. Alex, other questions for Ms. Phillips? I just want to note that um, I certainly appreciate your continuing to protect those trees. It's my design that saved those trees uh, from a napkin <laughs> sketch, actually. But there's a <laughs> tiny little jog and angle from the bridge going towards uh, 104. <laughs> um, and that was hard fought with the county. We had to deal with the county on that prior to when I was a council member. And it was, uh, county parks, uh, particularly when it comes to property questions are challenging. Um, and it's too bad too, that just as a bookmark, Kenmore did their projects with the county in the late nineties for less than $900,000 of each of the two tunnels. So that gives in an idea of how much inflationary pressures on public works projects have have accelerated and mm -hmm. gone through the roof to making things like this much more onerous and very, very difficult. I would finally note that the city of Shoreline did receive a federal grant, I believe for 28, 38 million mm -hmm. I'm, for their pedestrian overpass as part of the uh, 145th slash 148th station. 
So there are funds available there. And certainly this is of a scale that this community cannot afford without massive federal uh, funding or state funding for that. If there are no further questions, thank you so much for your, yes. So I just like some clarification as, sure. as we leave this item. So I've, I've heard some council members don't pursue anything. Some pursue the bridge some thought that, you know, there may be an opportunity in the future. So I guess the question is, do we return the 30,000 and we're done, or do we take this to 30% so that we have, you know, all these final answers with King County that would, would meet their requirements for the park space. And then I hate to say it, but, you know, put it on the shelf and let it collect some dust and, you know, for now. That's why we're here tonight is to get that direction of, does this go forward at all or are we finished? So. Thank you, Administrator Hill. I apologize for not getting to the actual question. What's your pleasure, Council? Councilman Riddle. Would you like me to make a formal motion for one of the options? Please. Okay. That would be. Um, I make a motion that we continue the bridge, the 30% level, so that we have a better understanding of what we have uh, going forward and then um, not moving forward with the bridge. Um, to repeat the last yeah, can you not me? going forward. Sorry, it's not going forward with the tunnel. tunnel. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I just make sure it's it salad. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I, the motion was made to move forward with starting the bridge option, uh, but not the tunnel. Is there a second? I second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any further discussion on the motion? Councilmember Levo. With regard to the motion, I am in favor of a bridge option as compared to a tunnel for all the reasons that have been discussed. Although I would uh, express that the study has done what we wanted it to do, which is to study the options and look at the different concepts to study whether or not a tunnel or a bridge would be uh, viable. Uh, there are cost and environmental considerations. With that, I would say the study for me has reached conclusion to say that this is really not viable for the city. And I would be fine at this point, just stopping and saying studies pro progressed and did what I think would be necessary in order to make a decision. Thank you, council member. Is there any further discussion on the motion on the table? Council member for Tani. Hey, yes, thank you. And uh, um, I, I, my point is that uh, the uh, rules kind of changed in the middle of the game here where we didn't know that King County was going to say no grade. And so when the uh, proposal was initially put forward, it was with the understanding that we could actually lift the uh, trail a bit and even maybe have an overpass over, uh, I forget what the name of the road, the extension by the Civic Club is called. But nevertheless, uh, that's not on the table anymore. So uh, we need to pursue this to the 30% and uh, I'm in support of the motion. That way we could actually have the definitive answer on this. And if we choose to pursue the bridge option at that point, we can certainly talk. Thank you, council member. Any council member, good. This is probably for you, uh, you guys. Uh, if pursuing that option, does it bind you to any having to do the, the work? Um, yeah, I would say I'm I'm in agreement with Councilmember Lebo that I we if we've already put the money forward, we can get to thirty percent. But I'm struggling to find a viable path other than just hoping for federal grant money. Which, yeah, so I, I we can get you know finish the contract that we currently have, but I just don't see. I think it's unlikely that we'll move forward past that, at least for me. Thank you, Council Member. Any further? Well, I, I just I just wanted to clarify what um, at what what point um, would we go forward with the contract we have right now? What does that entail? I have to leave that to Ms. Phillips to, or Mr. Hill. Bob. Oh, well, um, if I, I guess you don't have to pull up the last slide, but I I was hoping to find out if you wanted to change our thirty percent contract or leave it as is. Um, I didn't know abandoning it entirely was an option. Well, 
I, I think it's but always an option. Anything's I, I think an option. The Bill is, says it's an option. <laughs> so we, we have a contract that is for thirty percent design and some exploration of the the tunnel. So I think that if if the motion that's on the table passes, we will be going back and changing the contract with VNM just solely to look at the bridge to thirty percent design, and then that contract will end. Yeah. Does that resonate with everyone? Yes. Okay. Just making sure we have our data points here. Okay. Any further discussion? There's a motion on the table. Councilman Riddle. Uh, just a note that I think one of the reasons I want to finish out this 30% okay. now is because we kind of know who is at the King County Parks and sort of establishing this tentative approval of this new option, which we are presented with two options here today because it's really a schematic um test fit, if you will, at this point. So taking it to that 30% in conjunction with uh, working with King County right now, I feel gives us the best opportunity to knowing whether this is going to be somewhat successful in the future. Um, that That's kind of my thinking behind why we want to proceed with it at this time. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member, good. I agree with Larry and Council Member Le uh, Lebo and Larry over there. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm tired. Uh, we don't know what's going to be happening with Sound Transit and what design they're going to be putting through here. I don't think that that's a done deal yet. And I think that it could be a problem with any design coming, you know, just. I just think it might not be viable for the long term. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Okay, the motion on uh, before you right now by Council Member uh, Riddle is to pursue the bridge only option and abandon the tunnel question. All those in favor, uh, taking it through the 30% process with a contract coming back to amend, correct? Sorry, there's. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Tracy. Would you mute yourself, please? Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing voices again. It's, it's a little scary. Um, all those in favor of Councilmember Riddle's uh, motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any nays? Okay. Thank you, Council. That passes unanimously. That's uh, six to zero. Thank you so much. Thank Ms. you Phillips. so much. Thank you. You did very Thanks. well for your first time in front of this ornery bunch. Speak <laughs> <laughs> for yourself. Everybody, thank you. <laughs> okay, we're moving on with, um, let's see. Oh, wow, something really simple. How about, uh, do I hear a motion for adoption of the consent calendar? So moved. So moved. Second. It's been moved twice and seconded at least once. All those in favor of consent, adoption of the consent calendar, please signify by saying aye. 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 Three days. The ayes have it. It passes unanimously. Thank you, Council. We're moving on to ordinances and resolutions for introduction and referral. Uh, let's see. This is Mr. Hoffman. Director Hoffman is going to be joining us talking about resolution 24-1948, creating a temporary policy advisory task force for climate planning. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Mayor. Council, you. Mark Hoffman, Community Development Director for the city. Uh, this item that the mayor announces an introduction of a resolution. I don't have a presentation for this or the next item, but they're related uh, and it has a lot of background. So for some context, as you're already aware, we are midway through a two year process to periodic update our comprehensive plan policy document. That is due before December of this year, 2024. Uh, we layered upon that, we have another grant effort for middle housing. House Bill 1110, that runs through June of 2025, but has portions in the periodic update and portions that are out. Those are the development regulations. Layered Now layered upon that, we have another policy effort uh, for uh, climate planning. Uh, and to, in, the context is this new layer is not the previous two, totally separate. Um, but very much related in that it is policy formation. And uh, for history, um, the Growth Management Act was amended in the last session, now two sessions ago, 
to require a climate element in our comprehensive plan. The city's due date, because we're already underway with the periodic update, is 2029. They weren't sure how far the grant funding to offset those costs would go, but it went further than they thought. And the city has been uh, awarded $500,000. That item was introduced at your last meeting and is after this. The scope of work in the budget in that grant application and the award starts with a task for formation of a, uh, a climate policy action team. A lot of it is names. It's a mechanism to move forward in this policy uh, framework and adopt a climate element by uh, the now deadline, which is 2025 because of the grant deliverables. Um, with those other efforts, there's also an effort that you're aware of with the Climate Action Committee for a Climate Action Plan. Draft form will be uh, before you before May. So each of the existing groups are actively pursuing policy efforts and implementation and are uniquely positioned to help with this climate planning. Uh, because the scope includes the formation of this team, the decision has to be made who heads, who heads that effort. And as you know, the Planning Commission is tasked with uh, comprehensive plan amendments and making a recommendation to the City Council. So the effort has to at least include them. With the formation of the draft climate action plan, the CAC is also current and well-versed and expertise in climate planning. Uh, and so the thought was to come up with a new body to act and go forward with this effort, combining the two and simplifying by default, that means that one or the other is not the primary driver of the effort. You have to deal with planning commission either way, um, but you could involve the expertise and the uh, structure that we have set in your materials and the draft resolution outlines a potential task force in conformance with municipal code. This is an introduction before you tonight and we're seeking some input. We have not begun to recruit or discuss this at those committee meetings but they're aware that it's occurring. And depending on the input tonight and where we go from here, we can begin that effort. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hoffman. Colleagues, questions for Mr. Hoffman. I'm gonna start with Ms. Saunders down here. If she had, you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. No, that's okay. Um, I don't have any questions. I just um, wanted to thank you for um, all the work that you're doing on this. and. Uh, Appreciate you um, presenting this tonight to the council. Thank you. Colleagues, questions, Council Member Riddle. So, looking at the um, the purpose of the Climate Action Committee, which appears to be to create the Climate Action Plan, is the intent for that? Or is your thought right now that that committee would stay separate from this policy committee, policy uh, group, um, e even after they've submitted their plan? Or do you have any thoughts on where, how this happens? Uh, with all these moving parts, absolutely. The answer is yes, stay separate. The planning commission stays the planning commission, the CAC stays that, that body. Um, then the question becomes, why why throw another task force or another level on there? Um, uh, by combining them, it's not the creation of a third. It's combining the expertise. The next step that we have to do is an RFQ for a consultant to, to do this planning work. So the opportunity is that the, the those interested in being on this task force can volunteer for extra time while the planning commission does their regular work while the CAC does their regular work and report back. What it avoids is those two bodies having to meet jointly. Okay. So the idea would be, while they both have work yet to complete, the climate policy advisory team and the climate action committee that we currently have would, would, would continue to work in parallel and then after the Climate Action Committee has completed their duties, then we have to determine whether we want to keep them moving forward on a new topic or not. I think that sounds like that's going to be more of a council which, policy. Which is, is separate true? from this side. Which is separate from this. And I'm yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, <laughs> like we just I'm just trying to refer to shaking your shoulder. So right. <laughs> Yeah. Does Councilman Furutani have a different idea about how the I, CAC is going to end? That, that's, I guess, what I'm wondering. Councilman Furutani? Yep. Yep. I, d I don't mean to jump in front of Councilmember Goldman, but I feel compelled to speak. Um, yes, the this is a temporary committee, the one that we're considering right now. It's got a limited term until the comp plan update is done. And so my point is that um, the CAC is now moving into its implementation phase, as you saw from the work plan that they presented. And so they'll have other things to do, getting all the uh, actions that they recommended, at least partially to uh, legislative so that we can consider. It. Uh, so I don't see, a, uh, I, I think this is government working at its best, where we're taking the expertise of two committees and having sort of a steering committee uh, guide an immediate need that we have, that is to say the comp plan, the climate element update, and then they go off and go do their regular work. So I think this is a really great plan. I thank Director Hoffman for thinking of it. Council member, Council member Goldman, thank you for um, your patience. Yep. Yeah. Oh, no, that's quite right. I appreciated hearing Council member Furtani's perspective. Um, I guess I have one question and two comments. So first question, the $500,000 grant is that at all contingent on the Climate Commitment Act staying in force and not getting repealed by the initiative? Ooh. In short, most likely, yes. <laughs> there is a repealer clause. The intent is there. We've had no indication of that, at least I haven't. Uh, and the Growth Management Act has now been amended. So the, the path forward is certain, but I can't speak to changes in the legislature okay uh, i i just wanted to make sure that like the, the five like once we sign the agreement we're getting the money and we can we can proceed accordingly well it's it's a contract and it's a reimbursement basis so if we perform under the contract under the provisions the assumptions yes okay yeah and then my comments um, um you and i had an email back and forth kind of what uh, council member riddle was asking about pros and cons of establishing this task force versus leaving it in the hands of the individual committees. And I appreciate you providing that perspective about the advantages of having the task force. My related comment would be, I think it would be good to get feedback um, if it looks like there would be members from the Planning Commission, Climate Action Committee, and the Tree Board, just getting the feedback from the members of those committees if they would be in favor of this approach as well. Yes, and we intend to. We wanted to introduce this tonight, get any uh, feedback from council, and then we have our next round of uh, meetings, tree board, CAC, PC, where we've approached the issue. Uh, and an important comment was made. The assumption is that, that the makeup that's proposed in this resolution, that we have enough willing volunteers. Uh, and so an important concept or word that to add would be up to the final uh, makeup of this uh, uh, body, um, I think, would be highly dependent on enough volunteers. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Councilman Lego. Uh, thank you, Director Hoffman, for the uh, discussion. Uh, admittedly, I'm really slow tonight. It's been a really long day. Um, so if I understand this, and I'm going to tread ground again, just because I'm not quite getting it. So um, later on, we're going to have a resolution to accept the Department of Commerce Climate Planning Grant, which is gonna help us meet the requirements for our climate uh, component for our growth comprehensive plan. And so we're getting a jump on it because we're getting the grant. And that goes into our comprehensive plan. That's correct. Okay. So, so, oh, I'm sorry, did you have more? I'm going to keep going. <laughs> okay. So the grant facilitates uh, us updating the comprehensive plan. Does the grant require um, a climate advisory task force or suggest or recommend? Yeah, you know, I've thought of that. All the, all the reading that I've done, I have not seen a sentence that says, you shall form a okay. X. But okay. they do require a body to make a recommendation and do this work. So one option would be just to work with the current group, the the planning commission would be one option. That's my understanding. So the options in the, the cover sheet. Yeah. If this if this particular body was not formed, yes. then I would say at least rely on the planning commission with outside 
advise me. Okay. So the product of this um, temporary policy advisory task force is to go into the comprehensive plan. Correct. Okay. This, this year is a mandatory periodic update. Yeah. Then with the 2025, that would be our voluntary annual option. Okay. So our goal would be to finish this by 2025. The deliverables for the grant by June 31st or June 15th. And then the way we worded it is to have an actionable document before the council by then. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm good. And I, I, I like the approach. And I just echo the comments of the other council members. The next step for me would be engagement with the planning and the tree board and the um, climate action committee. Yes. <laughs> any, any. Thank you, Council. Uh, I, I'm supportive. Okay. Uh, anyone else comments, Councilor Riddle? Yeah, I, I also am supportive of, of the method you've used here. I wasn't challenging that they not be separate. I'm actually just wondering if the climate if the climate action committee will complete their duties mm -hmm. while this one is still going on going, and is that going to cause us any issues? Um, it sounds like that they have continuing duties that they will be doing. So that's not an issue. Um, so I appreciate what we have here. Um, the only thing I don't know if it makes uh, any difference right now, but the Climate Action Committee does have uh, two student seats, which are currently vacant. Um, but I would imagine that we would want um, this to be not student seats, obviously, um, because of the technical aspect of this policy making or is is that not something that you're concerned about but i've always liked that concept because of that shared education and input and inclusiveness um i would comment that due to the sheer bandwidth of the periodic update house bill 1110 development code regulation deadlines comprehensive two comprehensive plan amendments we're starting to need to move fast just to finish these mm -hmm. two years. Absolutely. So it's a nice feature. It would take more coordination. Um, with existing staff, we're very comfortable forming this task force because they know what they're doing. Uh, and the RFQ and the grant funds allow some of us existing staff to actually attend our regular meetings and not take the full burden of this task force as if we were forming a new commission. If we start adding elements of uh, students and so forth, it, it expands that that burden. The complexity of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think then the, the intent here is that the three members from the Climate Action Committee would be those of uh, the non-student members. Is the, the, their the likely intent? Yes. Their expertise, the Climate Action Plan, um, has elements of policy that we're going to going to try and fully incorporate into the periodic update. Okay. The 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 meat of the document are action items or implementation, which would uh, uh, considerably help after we have a climate element. The climate grant and deliverables are very specific. It's not five hundred thousand dollars here. Go do some climate planning. It's greenhouse gas, resiliency, sub-element studies. And so that's why the dollar amount is pretty high. Um, but they're well-versed to, they, they've just been through this process on, on there and can advise us to action items, lo, you know, local issues and so forth. So their participation is key. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, any other questions for Director Hoffman? I would just like to, oh. Councilmember Fertani, I just want to bookmark something when you're finished. Please. Thank you. And uh, um, Director Hoffman, uh, just a quick question. Um, is there any urgency to appointing this team? Um, yes, we need to move nimbly. There's <laughs> nothing imminent because the, everything depends on what happens to the next item. So as we're juggling a lot of items in April, we couldn't fully move on this. So if we spend April coming back to council on this task force, getting the input of those committees, doing the RFQ for the grant, um, I think we're on track. If we get into May and June, then I would be, become worried. Of course, uh, I'm asking whether we should waive the three touch rule and I'm, I'm hearing no. 
Uh, okay. Well, should we, Mr. Furtani, would you like to put, pose that question to your colleagues? Yes. Absolutely. Sorry, my apologies there. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and make your comment first? I just wanted to book Mark. This is one of, and enjoy, revel in this folks, because this is one of the rare times that mm -hmm. the legislature has funded a mandate um, that, <laughs> and generously, I think, honestly, uh, and, and they listened, which I, I, I'm really looking forward to that in the future, uh, because this came directly out of uh, many communities saying, hey, you're asking us to do so many of these things, but you're not giving us the resources. Mm -hmm. And this is one case I, I really want to support the good. And here we are. So mm -hmm. um, on that note, colleagues, the question at hand is whether you would support the three touch rule to Yes, I would. A wave the three touch rule, excuse me. Yeah, wait, wait. Um, I, I would say, again, this is contingent on the grant, and that's the next thing we're talking about. I would like us to move through the next item, and then we can come back to this if we feel that's appropriate, just so that we don't get ahead of ourselves. Fair enough. Councilmember Goldman. On um, point of order, um, once we've passed an ad agenda item, we would have to amend the agenda to bring it back for discussion. That is correct. Uh, we could bring it back in other business if we need to. Yeah, procedurally, yeah, other business or however, whatever your pleasure would be. Um, Council, what's your pleasure? Do you want to wait to talk about the Department of Commerce planning grant and then bring it back under other business if you so choose to? Or would you like to uh, entertain moving forward now? Which would I prefer to move forward? Moving forward. I prefer to move forward. Okay. Does would someone like to make a motion to that effect? Councilmember Fertani. So I'll move to waive the three touch rule on uh, see resolution 24 1948, creating a temporary policy advisory task force for climate planning. Councilmember Fertani has moved to waive the three touch rule regarding. Resolution 24, 1948. Do I hear a second? I second that. It's been moved and second. Any discussion on waiving the three touch rule? Councilmember Belibo, then Councilmember Goldman. So uh, I am supportive of this. I do think, though, that we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, as Director Hoffman says, if we give this the opportunity to be uh, collaborative with our commission and our climate action committee, uh, there is an opportunity to refine this, to improve it. Without a need to move tonight, I don't think that we are being respectful of the public when we move items that otherwise don't need to be moved when there's an opportunity to refine it. Um, so I think we should always be respectful of our public. And we've talked about this before, that if there are critical items, then we should move uh, with alacrity. But I don't see that this evening. I think it uh, doesn't represent us well. Mr. Goldman. Yes, so while I'm broadly supportive of the task force, I'm against waiving the three-touch rule. I'm um, looking at the calendar. The Climate Action Committee meets on April 2nd. The Tree Board meets on April 3rd. I think the Planning Commission at this point is meeting every other day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but it feels like if we wait until our April 11th meeting, Am I correct that all through the Climate Action Tree Board and planning, all three of them would have had a meeting between here and April 11th? Yes. Um, so in my mind, I think we should wait until April 11th, and that way we can get feedback from those three boards about if they like this approach. Thank you, Council Member. Oh, I support that. I, I, I respect that, what Council Member Goldman is saying. Thank you, Council Member Saunders. Council member for Tony. Thanks, Ed. I appreciate my colleagues for bringing me back in. I'm probably going to, I'm in fact going to vote against my own motion. So uh, <laughs> yes, your, your arguments are great. Mr. Fertani, would you like to withdraw your motion with the acquiescence of the seconder? I will, I will gladly move that. Does the seconder concur? Who's the seconder? I you concur. Are. I concur. Thank you. Okay, it's been uh, withdrawn uh, uh, in a friendly manner. I don't know other way to describe it. <laughs> okay, so uh, are you comfortable, colleagues, moving on to item number, resolution 24-1946? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Hoffman, you can 
return and come back. Um, <laughs> it's been around, there you go. <laughs> Welcome back. Good evening, <laughs> Mark Hoffman. <laughs> Introduce yourself, and please go right ahead. Uh, this next item is a second uh, time it's been before you. It was introduced Mar March 7th, I believe. There, there were some council comments that we were able to address. Uh, and so what you have are revised materials, um, specifically deputy uh, mayor suggested um, thermal impacts and community assets and, and so forth. After that uh, comment, we considered the language that we would discuss with, with Commerce, had a meeting with Commerce, talked about all the changes, uh, had a brief discussion about that specific change and agreed that the the language that we pose could be inserted in three places for resiliency and not need a, a review of a revised scope from their higher ups, contract central. Uh, and in that discussion, it was agreed it's it's within the scope of the intent. The issue was the 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 money is pretty specific of what it needs to achieve and can you do it? There are certain elements that were already planned that could get to this. So we're not sure how broad this is gonna be when we get to that moment, but we could certainly do this. So the wording is inserted in the um, draft agreement. Commerce is in agreement. They're poised with DocuSign to do this. They're all highlighted in the materials in your packet in yellow, uh, three types. The majority of those are dates to bring it current with the same scope. The three places we inserted uh, 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 the deputy mayor's suggestion, and then one addition at the end to change a an adopted document to a an actionable document. All those changes are ready to go. Uh, if if that's acceptable tonight and everything goes well, I call commerce tomorrow. If you have additional comments tonight, there is an additional opportunity tomorrow to discuss them in amendment. If they're not substantive, then we wouldn't have to come back. Thank you, Mark. Colleagues, questions. I would just note that um, Deputy Mayor Bodie and Councilmember Furtani and I all weighed in on some of this language, primarily Deputy Mayor Bodie and Mr. Hoffman. So there have been other eyes on this as well. Thoughts about the additions that were requested by Deputy Mayor Bodie? Councilmember Furtani, did you have any think? Nothing? Okay. Everyone's comfortable with where we are and Mr. Clark. Yeah, sorry, Councilmember Goldman. Um, yeah, it seems like the silence means that we're all happy. I'm happy with this, with the new language. So I would like to move that we waive the uh, three touch rule uh, with respect to resolution 24 1946. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded twice. Um, any further discussion on waiving the three touch rule regarding resolution 24, 1946? Um, I could, I'll, I'll be brief um, since members of the community, I think like when we explain when we're waiving our rules, um, in this case, we are accepting a grant. So this is a net benefit to the city. So I think that um, is good. And also it kind of builds that framework so that on April 11th, when we come back to discuss the task force, we have signed the contract for the grant. So I think it makes sense for us to move quickly on, on accepting the commerce grant. Excellent comments, Larry. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other comments about waiving the three touch rule? Okay. No, all, all those in favor of waiving the three touch rule and resolution 24, 1946 signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any nays? The ayes have it to waive the three touch rule. I would entertain a motion on resolution 24, 1946. Council member Furtani. I'd like to move uh, to approve resolution 24, 1946, authorizing the mayor to accept the Department of Commerce Climate Planning Grant. Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, to approve off, uh, Resolution 24, 1946, authorizing the mayor to accept the Department of Commerce Climate Planning Grant. Is there any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any nays? The ayes have it. It passes unanimously. Thank you so much, Council. And thank, thank you so much, Director Hoffman. Thank you very Excellent much. Excellent work. Hey.
Then we get to move on to Lori Roche is going to join us tonight to talk about Resolution 24, 1947, adopting the Lakefront Park preferred um, concept. Councilmember Fertani has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Fertani, did you have a, your hand's up. I believe he's frozen. Oh, oh, it's frozen. He's frozen. <laughs> um, I'm sleeping. We'll move on. Corey, welcome, <laughs> welcome, and welcome, Amber. Can you hear us? Okay. Excellent. Yes. So I'm here to seek approval of the Lakefront Park preferred um, concept plan. We have done rigorous outreach um, to the community through stakeholder engagement, pre-design groups, interpretive planning groups, uh, pre-design survey to the community, which we had. Uh, great response uh, to community workshops, updates to Parks Board and Council throughout this process. Um, approval of this concept plan allows consultants to begin schematic design and detailed cost and an analysts to reach the goal of submitting grant applications May 1st. Um, this was presented to you all Monday. We all talked about it. We did update the concept plan to reflect the hybrid option of forested canopy um, in the Lion Creek Preserve with um, low understory plants to do the hybrid option. Um, Stoqualmie Tribe recommended. And on Tuesday, the park board also agreed with this um, as well. So um, I... That's kind of what I have for you tonight. Thank, so. thank you so much. Uh, colleagues, questions for Ms. Roche or Amber, who is with us virtually. We had a robust discussion on Monday. Thank you for that. This, this body is speechless. <laughs> Councilmember Goldman. Yeah, um, I just want to thank you for all the work that you've done and especially uh, pivoting quickly to um, amend to have that hybrid option that kind of brings in what the community wants, what the tribes want. Um, yeah, I'm fully supportive of this uh, proposed uh, plan for the Lakefront Park, and I'm excited about the park overall. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. Goodness, I would entertain a motion to... Um, Adopt resolution 24, 1947, adopting the Lakefront Park preferred concept design plan. I move to adopt resolution 24, 1947, adopting the Lakefront Park preferred concept design plan. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion, Council? We lost Council Member Furtani, unfortunately. Unless Mr. Furtani is. No, we lost him, unfortunately. I know he would like to weigh in here. <laughs> Council Member Riddle. Um, this is a, an amazing moment in time. We have put in a lot of work and effort com communicating with the community, bringing in all the different stakeholders and coming to this design fairly consistently across the board. Um, it's just been a, a wonderful process to date. The amount of involvement we've had, uh, the survey, the workshops, um, I've just been really pleased with the process. And I think that having so much generalized agreement on this uh, plan to move forward with is testament to how much our community is in one mind of what they are seeing for this park. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to uh, adopt this concept and then see as uh, the concept gets refined uh, more and more, see what, what it really starts to actually kind of tangibly look like. Thank you. Thank you all for your efforts. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, any other comments? Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adopt resolution 24, 1947, uh, adopting the Lakefront Park preferred concept design plan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any nays? The ayes have it, it passes unanimously, I guess. It's not so much for fun, it's not. Might as well pass. It passes, okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Corey and Thank Amber. Excellent work. Yeah. And thanks to the community for all their input as well. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah. Take good care. Hey, thank you, Council. Uh, we're Council discussion or action and action. We have nothing here. Is there any other, are there any other items of business? No, oh, okay. We'll move on to Council committee reports. Um, Member Lebo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Uh, we met, uh, the Budget and Finance Committee met last Thursday on March 21st. Um, I want to compliment and recognize Director Vaughn and her excellent forecast report for our expenditures and revenue through the end of the biennium at the end of this year. Um, it was very clear, very concise. It is also sobering um, because public safety is the paramount duty of any council. And um, as we manage that, uh, we do see increasing expenditures on our public safety side with regard to our general fund. Uh, it's not unusual, but we are seeing expenditures run ahead of the revenue as we try and maintain the public safety for our community, which I think is admirable and something that we need to always consider. It does raise issues as we look to our new biennial budget for the end of the year about how we manage our expenditures with regard to our revenue. Um, and so I just wanna recognize the valuable work that all of our departments are doing to make sure that the public is safe and can come forward with us with options to how we address our biennial budget as we work through that at the end of the year. So more work to do, but we have a talented team to help us work it work through it. So Thank you very much, Charlie Bo. Colleagues, any let's see other committee reports? I don't think we do. Uh Deputy Rapodi is not here. We did have a committee of the whole meeting. Um and our vice chair is not here. So um would anybody like to describe that meeting? It was just, a, it was not just, it was a very robust discussion about the Lake Town Park, park preferred property preferred alternative. Lots of P's in there. Anything to add to that? Uh, um, other, may I? Yes, please, Councilman. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the consultants did bring very similar documentation that we saw here tonight. Um, they were very responsive. Uh, to all the different stakeholders. So it was really good for us to be able to come in and kind of put that last layer of our thoughts on top of this. And again, that we were all very similar uh, as uh, Council Member Goldman mentioned, um, looking at the, the Lion Creek Preserve with the eye of something that was not all forest, not meadow, but that sort of combined hybrid approach uh, that uh, was also sort of suggested by the tribes as they were um, brought in to, to look at this plan as well. So it was just a great opportunity uh, for us to bring in our thoughts. And I think it was a wonderful discussion um, and really prepared us to be able to make a relatively quick decision here tonight in front of the community. So we did spend a couple hour and a half <laughs> on this in order to be prepared to make this uh, relatively quick um, approval this evening. Thank you, council member. Uh, council member reports. Mr. Coleman, you started to raise your hand. Nope. nope. Um, anyone have reports? Mr. Fertoni, we've lost him, unfortunately. Um, okay. Uh, move on to the mayor's report. Boy, there's been a lot going on. Um, <laughs> I just want to admit, I mentioned this in the leadership team meeting the other day, but as, as an interesting side note, be careful. There are deer out there. They're running across our state highways right now. So um, be, be cautious folks, so there's not a tragedy. A uh, couple other things. Um, we did have um, some issues with unwelcome guests who were uncivil at the committee of the whole meeting. Those same bad actors apparently appeared tonight, but they came in late. So our rules prohibited them from joining the meeting. As I indicated before, it appears that one of them has probably crossed a line in terms of the law. We're gonna be looking into this further. Uh, and I'm also going to be participating in a round table with the Association of Washington Cities. The CEO invited me to participate about Zoom bombers. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about what actually occurred on Monday because I'm not gonna give these folks license or any more airtime. Um, it's a sad commentary and something's gotta change. And I'm hoping that the legal avenues that are open to us may have an impact. Um, a bunch of other positive things. Boy, we're moving right along with a lot of these projects. Uh, I thank you all for your consideration of preferred proposal, proposal and all the other information we've got here. I really want to say to hats off to all of you and to the city staff for a wonderful council retreat over, over the, this past weekend. Uh, I thought that was an outstanding conversation. And as I indicated to you, 
There were no surprises. We have all been talking about these things for quite a considerable amount of time. You all have been, even new members. Um, and as Council Member Lebo and I were talking about, there there really was nothing out of the ordinary. We just, you all had, had some really great discussions and the administration will be moving forward as quickly as we can to come back with proposals on your on your um, goals that, you're, that you've set. Um, I think that's pretty much all I had. We I do wanna say that Mr. Hoffman has indicated to us that he has a very, very full schedule. He is juggling a lot of things right now, but I wanna commend that his department, uh, one, that they're fully staffed, uh, <laughs> which is extraordinary. Many thanks for that, Mark. I know that's a big lift and to our HR department. And also um, the sent I get, sentiment I get, and I mentioned this before, about other communities, many of them are sort of in panic mode about comprehensive plans. And I appreciate that um, Mark is a very calm person. He is not panicking. And so we're all gonna take the tone for the, the uh, from him. So thank you, Mark, for that. And with that, Mr. Hill, City Administrator's Report. I think Mark might tell you on the inside he's panicking. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, just quickly, this morning, we worked with Jake Johnson, our federal lobbyist, and the application for the $3 million to help us assist on the Lakefront Park was submitted to Senator Cantwell's office, and we were waiting for the other portals to open up, and so it's a long shot. It's a very overprescribed fund, but we're going to, we had a good response. I think we had 14 letters of support um, from some of our commissions and committees, as well as other cities and um, Forterra, everybody who's been involved in this process. So that that's out there. You know, just keep your fingers crossed. And um, other than that, I just want to give hats off to Director Vaughn. If you've seen the CA report, she graduated from the Women's Leadership yes. Academy a um, week ago. She has future aspirations of city administrator, city manager positions. Um, so I encouraged her and she did well. And I look forward to attending the, the conference this fall because as you saw in the report, her team won. And so they get to come to the city manager administrator fall conference and present to that group. So that should be enjoyable. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more item folks. Uh, Mr. Hill and I had a very productive meeting with the new uh, interim sound transit CEO, Jaron Sparman. I found Mr. Sparman to be a very uh, generous um, and thoughtful man. I think he is listening to concerns that the community, as well as we all have about various aspects of the project. Uh, it was a it was a very positive conversation focused on solutions and uh, in the spirit of trying to reset our relationship with the highest levels of sound transit. And I do deeply appreciate him being willing to come out and meet with us. It was at his initiative too. So I'm hopeful, and I won't do math on TV, but I'm hopeful that there will be some uh, fruits for, for our labors coming up here from that conversation uh, in the very near future. And I look forward to their commitment to increase communication and outreach with, with the community about the various issues that we all have to share and face. So there's nothing else for the good over the order. I would suggest we're adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.